All right, so I guess we can get started. Uh, this is the third part of uh, the lecture on energy-based models, uh, which we are, we are going to continue a little bit what we talked about last time on sparse coding and uh, talk about uh, GANs very briefly. You'll hear more about it tomorrow from uh, Alfredo, and then talk about learning world models and uh, similar things. Also about a bit of a little bit about exotic uh, self-supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms <clears throat> that are kind of you know active research topics at the moment. Uh, so one thing um, I talked about last time was sparse coding, and um, I'm going to mention just a very simple idea, which, cons which consists in sort of um, <clears throat> combining uh, uh, sparse coding or the idea of sparse autoencoder with uh, discriminative training. So imagine that the architecture I'm showing you here, uh, the the encoder, if you will, the the first uh, uh, part uh, on the left, is uh, mostly uh, similar to the encoder I talked about for the the lista method. So you start with uh, the x variable, you run it through a matrix, um, then you run that through a nonlinearity, uh, could be a ReLU, for example. This is the case here, um, and then you take the the result. Uh, multiplied by uh, some matrix, which we're going to learn. Add this with the product of the input by the encoding matrix WE, and then pass this to a nonlinearity. And you can repeat this little block, this green block here, multiple times. Each of those is uh, a layer, basically, that consists in uh, a matrix or a bunch of convolutions, uh, in addition with uh, some you know pre-existing variable and uh, a nonlinearity. So this is you know. A funny kind of neural network where you have kind of uh, skipping connections. <clears throat> and then we're going to train this neural network to do uh, three different things or with three different criteria. One criterion is going to be uh, just reconstruct X. Okay. So there's going to be a decoding matrix that is uh, going to reproduce the input on the output. And we're going to do this by just minimizing squared error. Uh, so this is what's indicated by the decoding filters here. And again, this could be convolutional or not, depending on which version you um, you like. Uh, there's going to be an L1 criterion on the on the feature uh, vector that makes it sparse. So this is very much like uh, a sparse autoencoder of the type that we talked about last week. But then we're also going to add a third term, and this third term is going to be basically a uh, a simple linear uh, classifier, which uh, is going to try to predict a category, okay? And we're going to train the system to minimize all three criteria at the same time. So this is a sparse autoencoder that also tries to find codes that do a good job at prediction. Um, and this is sort of a good way. You can you can see this in two different ways. You can you can see this as an autoencoder that is biased towards producing good labels, or you can see this as a classifier, multi-layer classifier, that is regularized by an autoencoder. What's the advantage of this? Well, the advantage is that by forcing the system to find representations here at the second last layer that uh, can reconstruct the input, then you're basically biasing the system towards extracting features that contain as much information about the input as possible. So that sort of uh, <clears throat> makes the features richer, if you want. It forces the system to not generate degenerate features, but to generate features that contain as much information as possible about uh, about the input. Um, that works pretty well. I think it's an underexplored method for uh, uh, training uh, neural nets um, because very often we don't have enough uh, label training data or when the, the training data is such that you don't have a lot of categories um, to work with. Maybe it's a two or three or 10 class uh, problem, which we know tend to produce very degenerate, degenerate features uh, in a neural net, as we discussed last time. Then forcing the system to reconstruct basically tells it, you know, you can't generate features that are too degenerate, will so degenerate that uh, you can't reconstruct the input from it. So that's sort of a good, you could think of it as a good regularizer. Okay, group sparsity and structural sparsity. So there's some work uh, going back about 10 years, maybe a little more. Um, in fact, the first work on this are about 20 years old on the idea of group sparsity. What does that mean? Um, here, is the, here is the idea. The idea is to train a system to generate sparse features, but not just uh, 
uh, normal features that are extracted, say, by a bunch of convolutions and, and values, but to basically produce sparse features that are sparse after the pooling. Okay, so you you essentially have a system that uh, consists of convolutions, nonlinearity, and pooling. And you try to make those features sparse. Um, and there's a, a number of different work. The idea goes back to Ivarinen and Hoyer in 2001 uh, in the context of ICA, Independent Component Analysis. And then there were you know, a few other papers, one by Ozindero in Jeff Eaton's group, um, and then Korai uh, who was a student of mine back in the late uh, 2000, uh, Carl Greger, who was posed up with me, Julien Meral, who is in, uh, in France, and, and a bunch of other people on, on this idea of structure sparse coding. So the idea basically is you take, um, uh, uh, so some of those uh, models only have an encoder, some of them only have a decoder, and some of them are autoencoders, right? So the one on the left, as in was model, is an encoder-only model. Um, Julien Meral's model is a decoder-only model, and Korai Kevichelou's model is uh, uh, basically an autoencoder, a sparse autoencoder of the type that we talked about last time. Um, so um, how does that work? Uh, let's take, uh, say, an encoder-only model. You have a feature extractor, which consists of convolutions or maybe just uh, freely connected uh, uh, matrices over a patch, an image patch, for example. And then instead of forcing the output of this to be uh, after a nonlinearity, instead of forcing that to be sparse, you, you put a, a pooling layer and you, you force the pooling to be sparse. Uh, and this applies to uh, all three of those. Um, so here is a, a more specific example. This is the, the version that uh, Corey Kibitru, uh did for his PhD thesis, where he had uh, a sparse autoencoder. So you have an encoding function, G E of W E Y I, could be multiple layers. In this case, it was basically just two layers uh, with one nonlinearity. You have a decoder, which in this case was linear, W D times Z. You have a latent variable Z. And that latent variable, instead of going to an L1, it goes through um, basically an L2, but it's L2 over groups, right? So you take a group of components of Z, you compute the L2 norm, not the square of the L2 norm, but the L2 norm, which means the square root of the sum of the values uh, of those components, uh, of the square of those components, right? So take each component, compute the square, and then compute the sum of a group of those squares and then compute the square root of that. So that's the L2 norm of that within that group. And then you do this for multiple groups. The groups can be overlapping or non-overlapping and you compute their sum and that's your regularizer. That's your sparsity regularizer. So what does that uh, tend to do? It tends to basically turn off the maximum number of groups, okay? The system basically is sparsity on groups. So it wants the smallest number of groups to be on at any one time. But within a group, because it's an L2 norm within a group, it doesn't care how many units are on within the group. So uh, many units can be on within a group. So what does that do? It, it forces the system, basically, to group within a pool features that turn on simultaneously, right? So if you have features that are very similar, feature extra extra extractors that are very similar, filters that are very similar in a conventional net, then those features will tend to kind of, uh, when you do the training, they'll tend to group themselves within a group because they will tend to be act activated together. And that's the best way to minimize the number of groups that are activated at any one time. Um, so to get those, uh, those, those interesting kind of uh, uh, pictures here, the way this was obtained is by, uh, here are the groups, uh, so what, what you're looking at here are the either the uh, I think it's the decoding matrix. So these are the 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 columns of the WD matrix um, that we we can reconstruct an image patch from uh, the the sparse code by uh, multiplying by that matrix. Um, but what we do here is that we group those features into blocks of 36. So we arrange all the features in a 2D map that has nothing to do with the topology of the image. We can choose any topology we want. In fact, this is not actually a 2D topology. It's a, it's a toroidal topology. So the left side touches the right side and the top uh, touches the bottom. So it's topo topologically identical to a torus. 
And what we do is we, uh, uh, we group uh, uh, sets of 36 features within a group, okay? And those uh, groups of 36 features overlap by, by three columns and three rows, okay? So we have multiple groups of 36 features, six by six, shifted by three. Um, you could think of this as kind of pooling over feature, but not pooling over space because there's no space here. It's a fully connected network. Um, but it has a bit of the flavor, the same flavor as pooling, except here you, you pool over 36 features. You don't pool over space. All right. So, um, so then you, you uh, compute the sum of the L2 norm of the, fe the features that are within uh, each group. And that's the regularizer you use when you train your, your sparse autoencoder. So what the system uh, wants to do is minimize the number of groups that are on at any one time. And so, as I said before, it, it basically, uh, it regroups all the features that are similar and likely to fire simultaneously into, into groups. And because the groups overlap, then it creates those kind of slowly, slowly evolving sets of features that sort of uh, seem to kind of swirl around uh, uh, a point. So the features you get as a result of this have some sort of invariance and they have some invariance not to shift but to things like rotation and scale and things like that, whatever the system decides. So here, the reason for choosing a 2D topology is basically just for, you know, to make it look beautiful, but uh, you, could, you could choose any kind of topology you want. What is on the X axis and the Y axis here in this diagram? So those are arbitrary axes. Um, I have, um, I don't even remember how many features there are here. This, uh, this might be 256 features, I think. It's 16 by 16. So there's 256 uh, hidden units, right? So imagine a network that has a 12 by 12 input patch, okay? An input image, it's a patch from an image and 256 uh, uh, hidden units uh, with uh, fully connect, full connection, uh, non-linearity, and there's uh, uh, another layer on top. Um, then that's the encoder. And then you have uh, this group sparsity and then the, the decoder is linear, okay? And what you're seeing here are the columns of the decoder and they are organized in a 2D topology, okay? But it's arbitrary. Each of these squares is a column of the decoder. Each of these squares is a column of the decoder, gotcha. but also corresponds to a component of Z, okay? A component of the, for the feature, uh, mm -hmm. the feature vector. And so they are organized in a 16 by 16 matrix, but it's, it's kind of arbitrary. We just, you know, put them in a, in a matrix and then we train. And because uh, the groups uh, take kind of six by six neighborhoods in this topology, the system naturally kind of learns features that are similar when they're nearby within this topology. All right. But again, I could have chosen any kind of topology, uh, 1D, 2D, 3D, or even some graph uh, 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 neighborhood of some kind, as, as long as the pooling is uh, you know, between neighbors on the graph, uh, that's, that will work. So um, what I've done here is kind of repeat this, this little uh, pattern um, to kind of show, uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's toroidal, uh, to show the, you know, how those, those, those patterns kind of repeat and are sort of periodical. And the reason for visualizing it this way is that this is the kind of stuff that neuroscientists observe when they poke electrodes in the visual, primary visual cortex of, uh, of uh, mammals, but most, uh, most animals that have good vision. Uh, they see kind of those kind of swirling patterns where neighboring neurons detect similar features, which means similar oriented edges. They are sensitive to oriented edges and, and neighboring uh, neurons are, are sensitive to similar angles or the same angles at similar scale or, or things like that. And so uh, perhaps this is how, you know, the brain organizes its, uh, its neurons. It's by kind of basically having some sort of criterion on the complex cells, which are the equivalent of the pooling uh, units that we're seeing here. Um, here is the, uh, another example here. So this one is uh, not, at the patch level, but it uses local connections, but it's not convolutional in the sense that it doesn't use uh, shared weights. The reason for doing this is to have some, you know, a semi-realistic 
uh, sort of correspondence to a uh, uh, sort of biological uh, learning where, of course, you know, neurons in the brain can't share, can't share weights, right? They, um, they end up being similar because, you know, they train using some sort of uh, unsupervised learning, but, um, but there is no such thing as, as weight sharing in the brain, as far as we know. So it was asked if the uh, if a similar similar strategy of the training of the autoencoder with the uh, classifier and the regular, regularizer can be applied for a variation autoencoder and whether this has been explored if it works as well for the first so, slide you show. Yeah, so um, you know, basically uh, adding noise in a variation autoencoder and forcing sparsity are basically two ways to achieve the same purpose, which is reduce the capacity of the of the latent variable, reduce the capacity of the, of the code that is extracted by the autoencoder. And this is what prevents the system from learning a, a trivial identity function, which would not be useful, right? And what we talked about the, the last couple of times is the fact that if you reduce the information capacity of the latent variable of the code, you, uh, as a consequence, you also minimize the volume of space that can take low energy. Okay, because you limit the number of configurations of the code. And so as a consequence, you kind of limit the volume of space that can take low energy. So essentially this idea of uh, regularizing with L1 or sparsity or something like this, or adding noise to a code while limiting the norm of the code, uh, achieve the same purpose, which is limiting the capacity of the, of the code for the purpose of limiting the volume uh, of space that can take low energy. And as a consequence, if you train part of the space to have low energy by minimizing the reconstruction error on your training samples, automatically the rest of the space will have higher energy because the capacity, the volume that can take low energy is limited. Um, so this is, uh, just to recap uh, what we talked about last time and, and a couple of weeks ago, uh, this is to, this is sort of the alternative. So those kind of architectural methods are alternatives to the contrastive methods where you explicitly push up on the energy of bad samples, which means you have to come up with a good idea, you know, a good way of generating bad samples in that case, okay? So again, remember those two types of methods, contrastive methods, you push down the energy of the training samples, you push up the energy of stuff outside, either by corrupting the original samples or by doing uh, 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 gradient, noisy gradient descent, you know, contrastive divergence, things like this, or by generating contrastive points in some way um, we, we've seen a bunch of different contrastive methods. And then the alternative is uh, um, limiting the capacity of, of a code uh, or, or kind of limiting the volume of stuff that can take low energy in the context of an autoencoder or a predictor. This means limiting the capacity of the code. Uh, and there are many ways to do this. One way is through sparsity. One way is through adding noise while limiting the norm, that's the AEs. And there are other ways that we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Whenever you were talking before about the group sparsity, uh, you were summing just a few samples, like a, a few indexes within a small range. What is that PJ? Maybe I didn't... So PJ is a group. It's a pool. So imagine this is a pool, like in a convolutional net, but the pool, instead of uh, pulling just over space, it pulls over features as well, okay? For a fully connected network, it just pulls over components of Z, just features. Okay, so P PJ is like a set of uh, indexes. PJ is a subset of uh, indices of Z, of components of Z, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Right, so here PJ is a group of six uh, components of Z that happen to be neighbors in this topology. Okay, and that's, that's one P. And the next P is a similar square, six by six square, shifted by three pixels to the left, to the top, or uh, or bottom. Okay, okay, and that's right, top, bottom. Okay, thanks. So the overlapping between the groups is what kind of uh, uh, represents this topology, if you want. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so. In this, uh, this experiment, you know, is, is, uh, is very similar to the one we just uh, talked about, except here um, we have local connections. So we have an input, it's a two dimensional input here. We kind of only represent a 1D version of it. And, and we have uh, units, uh, possibly multiple units at one location. 
looking at a piece of the input, kind of a local patch on the input. And then those sets of, those sets of units are um, kind of, you know, replicated uh, multiple times, but there's no shared weights. Um, so the, the units, there's kind of units everywhere on the input, but they, the weights are not shared. Okay, they're just locally connected. So I guess I'm not quite understanding the overall concept of the of feature pooling. Um, I mean, if I think about it in terms of like pooling that we used in, in convolutional networks, then it it's straightforward, but I don't really understand how we, how feature pooling works. Okay, uh, let, me, let me draw a picture, maybe that'll be clear. Okay. okay, so you start with an input vector, okay, multiplied by a matrix or pass it through uh, some sort of uh, uh, encoder, right? Uh, which may have values and whatever, or multiple matrices inside. Okay, maybe multiple layers. And you get a feature vector. Okay, so let's call that Z. And now, and now you, do, you do pooling essentially. So you divide this into groups. In this case, they're non-overlapping. And you compute the, within one of those groups, you compute the square root of the sum of the squares of those ZIs where I belong to the group, the pool, okay? It's called P because it's a pool. Okay, and you do this for all the groups, right? So what you get here, this output here looks very much like the output of a pooling layer in a convolutional net. This is not a convolutional net, okay? It's a fully connected uh, network here. Uh, but the result is the same. <clears throat> and that's your, that's your regularizer. Now, in the example I just showed, you take the Z and this is what you send to a decoder matrix from which you reconstruct uh, the input. Okay, so this is Y, this is Y bar. That's a prediction for the reconstruction. And this, uh, this, po this pooled layer here is, is only used uh, to, um, uh, compute the regularizer. It's not actually used as uh, for reconstruction. You reconstruct from the sparse code directly. But it is, it looks very much like a pooling layer. Now, if this were, uh, if this were a, a, um, a convolutional net, uh, then that, that dimension uh, or a feature here would be uh, features, but you would have multiple feature maps. Okay, so I'm representing the feature dimension vertically. Then the encoder would do multiple convolutions and would uh, also generate multiple feature maps, perhaps a larger number. And then the kind of pooling we would do here is uh, a pooling where, so each, uh, after pooling, we would take a window over space as well as over features and compute the square root of some square there. And that gives us one output in our pooling uh, output. And then we have multiple groups of features like this that go into different uh, pooling. So it doesn't matter whether this is convolutional or not. In convolutions, you would pool over space as well as uh, feature type, but um, um, if you don't have convolutions, you just pull over features. And that, you know, builds invariance to whatever it is that uh, the system think, uh, thinks makes sense. Is that clear? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it's, it's more clear. Thank you. Um, Tristan, I have a question for when you do, when you split the Z into groups and do the pooling, would, would those groups overlap? Right, so uh, in the example I showed here, they, they do not overlap, but uh, you can make them overlap, okay? So, so let's say we have uh, a feature vector Z. I can uh, take a pool here and a pool here and a pool here, and here those groups overlap. And if I do this and I do group sparsity where these are the groups, 
what's going to happen is that uh, I'm going to have sort of a continuously varying set of features here that sort of vary from one end to the other because the system is going to want to group within a pool features that are similar. And so because of the overlap, it's going to sort of continuously vary them so that they change slowly uh, over, the, over the vector. Now, uh, in the pictures that I showed in the slides, uh, instead of organizing the, the Z features here in a 1D topology, I organize them in a 2D topology and I made the groups two dimensional, right? So I take a six by six block, uh, that's one group. And then the next group will be another six by six block with some overlap. And then the next group will be uh, yet another six by six block. Okay, and maybe I have an another one because I have a toroidal topology that takes th these guys and these guys. Okay, and then there is, you know, the, a similar thing kind of, um, you know, sliding up, etc. So the groups basically are those six by six windows that are shifted by three and, and overlapping. And so that's how you get those sort of continuously varying uh, features uh, along, the, along the dimension, the two dimensions. I could have equally well uh, chosen to uh, organize this into, in a 3D topology or into some sort of tree, right? So I, I take all the components of Z and I organize them uh, in some sort of graph, perhaps a tree. So this is called structured, uh, structural sparsity, not group sparsity anymore. Well, it depends how you do it, I guess. And then the groups would be things like, uh, this, would, this would be a group and then perhaps this would be a group as well. Uh, and I can organize a group in sort of uh, uh, Russian dolls like this. Uh, and uh, what's gonna happen there is that the, the groups that um, the units that are in many groups will tend to be very sparse, whereas the groups, the units that are in a few groups will tend to be less sparse. And so if, you're, if you do something like this with a tree, what happens here is that the the feature in the center tends to be not sparse at all. It's gonna be something that really sort of detects just you know very sort of generic features. And then at the first level in the tree, they're gonna be a little sparse. So they're gonna be sort of very sort of smooth edge extractors or something like that. And then the more you go inside of the tree, the more uh, each feature enters in a large number of pools and therefore they get more uh, pressure to be sparse. And so they end up being much sparser which means they end up being more selective for particular features. Um, and what happens there is that uh, when you show an image, it tends to favor activating features that are along uh, one particular branch in that tree, um, because that's the best way to sort of minimize the number of pools that are on at any one time. Uh, so that's called structural sparsity. Uh, and there's a number of papers uh, on this by uh, uh, Julien Meral. So this, this goes back about, about 10 years ago and uh, Rodolphe Genaton, I mean, they co-authored this, uh, senior author was Francis Back. Um, I, re I, I put the reference in uh, one of the slides uh, and there's a paper by my group also uh, by uh, Arthur Schlamm, which I'll, I'll go to in a minute. Can yep. you explain why grouping regularization actually helps in grouping similar features? Well, so that's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, does it help? <laughs> and, uh, and the answer is not clear. So uh, those experiments were done uh, quite a while ago before the computation was really available and the data was available uh, for, for this to really kind of work at, at a big scale. This was mostly uh, viewed as uh, the people interested in this were interested in two things. They were either interested in unsupervised learning for things like image restoration and stuff like that. This was what Julien Meral was doing. Um, or they were interested in uh, uh, unsupervised or self-supervised pre-training because at the time the data sets were very small for, for training uh, uh, convolutional nets. They were too small. So they, they had to be some sort of pre-training procedure, uh, which is what I was interested in. Um, and so it's the same motivation that we now have again for self-supervised uh, learning. But uh, a lot of those methods haven't been brought back to the fore. 
They tended to work very well when the data set was small. Um, so they tended to kind of improve performance of, uh, let's say, a convolutional net if you pre-train this uh, using a method. Uh, so using a method very similar to the one I, I, uh, I showed earlier. So something a bit like this, but convolutional. So make the, the encoder and the decoder uh, convolutional and, uh, and, and train with uh, group sparsity on complex cells. And then uh, after you're, you're done pre-training uh, the system, you get rid of the decoder. You only use the encoder as a feature extractor for uh, say the first layer of a convolutional net and you stick a second layer on top of it. Okay, so let me go through this a little bit. Um, so you start, you start with, a, with an image you um, you have uh, an encoder which is basically uh, convolution uh, radio. Not much more than that. Okay, just convolution radio. Uh, there needs to be some sort of scaling layer afterwards for for this particular case. Um, and you you train with group group sparsity. So you have a linear decoder, and you kind of reconstruct the input, uh, and you have uh, a um, you have a criterion here, which is this uh, group L one. Okay, so it's sum over group. Uh, sorry, I call the group P right. Sum over group of square root of sum for I in the group of ZI squared. Okay, so that's group sparsity. So you train this little uh, sparse uh, autoencoder with group sparsity. And then what you do is you 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 take the the this the this group sparsity layer that you just used as a as a as a regularizer. And so you basically eliminate um, you cut this part out of the network. You take the group sparsity, which is really a pooling layer, an L2 pooling layer, and you stick it here. Okay, so this is basically L2 pooling. But it has the same architecture as the one you use for the, um, you know, for the groups, the group sparsity. And then you use that as a feature extractor. Okay, which is like, it's like the first pair of layers of a convolutional net, convolution value pooling. Okay, but it's L2 pooling, not max pooling. And then you can repeat the process. You can train another instance of this network, have a couple layers here. Um, I'm gonna, and uh, have a decoder, have this uh, L2 uh, uh, pooling and, and sparsity criterion, train this to reconstruct its input, and then Stick the pudding on top, eliminate this, and now we have you have a pre-trained two-layer convolutional net. Okay, this is uh, a procedure that some people call stacked autoencoder. Okay, so you train an autoencoder to extract features, and then you and then you generate features with the encoder of that part of that of that autoencoder, and you stick another layer on top, train that as an autoencoder, and then keep going. And the only characteristic here is that this autoencoder is trained with uh, uh, you know, to produce invariant features through uh, group, group sparsity, essentially. We use all possible subtrees as groups in the previous example? Uh, no, that's kind of up to you, really. Uh, what structure you use here, you can use multiple trees, you can use, if you want multiple features to kind of be, uh, to represent uh, an input even at uh, low frequency. So that's really up to you. Um, you know, it could be like what you can afford uh, what you can do also is train the system with, you know, a, a bigger tree than necessary and then sort of prune the tree whenever there are branches that are not used or used very rarely. Okay, so this is a, the, the experiment I showed here is uh, similar, but there's only local connections and no, um, no weight sharing. <clears throat> and what you see here is this, again, this organization of the features uh, in terms of what neuroscientists call uh, pinwheel patterns. So pinwheel patterns are those patterns where the uh, orientation selectivity varies continuously as you go around one of those red dots. Um, so you take one of those red dots and if you kind of do a little circle around the, the red dots, what you notice is that the orientation 
of the feature of the, the edge extractor kind of varies continuously as you move around. Uh, and those are called pinwheel patterns and they are observed in the, in the brain. In fact, the, those pictures here on the right come from neuroscience papers that describe this where the, the, the color here encodes the orientation selectivity. Uh, the little stars indicate those uh, um, kind of the, the singularities here, the, the, the center of the pinwheels. Is the group sparsity term train uh, to have a small value? Well, it's a regularizer, right? Uh, let me go back to the... Um, it's, a, it's, it's a cost function during training or during inference, depending on whether you use the... Uh, the sort of predictive version of it where, where you have latent variable or not, but, um, but it, it's basically just, a, it's basically just a, a term in the energy, right? So the term itself is not trained, it's fixed, right? It's just the L2 norm over groups and the groups are predetermined. Uh, but because it's a criterion, it sort of determines what the, what the encoder and the decoders will do, what type of features will be extracted. Here is, um, Another example of uh, sort of, you know, exotic way of doing uh, sparse coding through lateral inhibition. And there's a, a bunch of different ways to do this that people have proposed. Um, this one came, came from uh, uh, Carol Greger and Arthur Schlamm in my lab about 10 years ago. And uh, so here there's, uh, again, a linear decoder with a square reconstruction error. This is WZ minus X, where X is the input here in this case. And then there is a, a criterion uh, in the energy which is uh, the vector formed by the absolute values of Z transpose times some matrix times the vector itself. So it's an, um, a kind of a quadratic uh, form uh, that involves Z and this matrix S. And the matrix S is uh, either determined by hand or um, uh, learned so as to kind of maximize this term, okay? And if the terms in, uh, in S uh, are positive and large, if one particular term Sij is large, what, what that means is that the system does not want Zi and Zj to be on at the same time, okay? It wants Z, if Zi is on and Sij is large, then it wants Zj to be off and vice versa, okay? And so it's sort of a mutual inhibition. Uh, people use, people call this lateral inhibition uh, in, uh, in neuroscience. Uh, it's basically, you know, all your feature vectors basically inhibit other feature vectors through this matrix S. You can decide that the matrix S a priori is structured. So you can decide that only some terms are non-zero. You can decide that some terms, uh, those terms are fixed or can be trained. And the way you train them is by actually maximizing. Uh, so it's kind of adversarial training a little bit. You, you try to find the, the value of S that sort of, you know, uh, is as large as, as possible, if you want, within limits. Um, above a certain value of Sij, one of the Z, one of Zi or Zj is going to go to zero and that term is going to disappear. So the system is going to, you know, uh, maximize the Sij's until uh, it's large enough to kind of do the mutual in inhibition between Zi and Zj. And it's not going to go any further because it, it doesn't need to. Um, and again, if you organize S, uh, um, in terms of a, a tree. So, so here, the, the lines represent the, the zero terms uh, in the S matrix. And whenever you don't have a line between two features, there's a, no, there's a non zero term in the S matrix, right? So every feature inhibits all other features except the ones that are up the tree or down the tree uh, from it. Uh, and this is very much like, like group sparsity a little bit. It's kind of the uh, kind of the converse, if you want, of, of group sparsity. Instead of, of saying uh, features within a branch of the tree need to be activated together by minimizing, you know, uh, L2, minimizing the number of such groups that are on, here you explicitly uh, have a sort of inhibition uh, term that uh, uh, for every, every feature inhibits all other features in all the other branches uh, of the tree. And what you see again is that you see this, uh, uh, systems are organizing the features in a more or less sort of continuous fashion um, and in such a way that 
features along a branch of the tree correspond to basically the same feature, but with uh, sort of different levels of selectivity. And then uh, features along the periphery sort of vary more or less continuously because there is you know, inhibition, uh, not just at the bottom level, but also at the middle level. Okay, so to, uh, to go back to this, the way you train the system is uh, at each iteration, you give an X, you find the Z that minimizes this energy function. So you find the Z that reconstructs, but also minimizes the second term, which means that if you have an SIJ term that is uh, non-zero, it wants either ZI or ZJ to be zero or at least very small. Um, you do one step of gradient descent now to uh, 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 turn to kind of update uh, W, so as to minimize the reconstruction error. And you do also, if you want, you can do one step of gradient ascent to make the terms in S larger um, by kind of computing the gradient of this energy with respect to S, but then going up the energy, not down. Uh, again, if you use a, not a tree, but sort of some sort of 2D topology, you also get those kind of, those kind of patterns. and more complex ones if, uh, if there are kind of uh, multiple scales for the features. Okay, so, so much for sparse coding and structured sparse coding. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you about this is because uh, although those don't have a huge amount of practical applications, the sparse coding, structured sparse coding, uh, they, in my opinion, uh, will be the basis for kind of self-supervised learning methods of the next few years. As I told you, I think self surprise learning right now is the hottest topic in NLP, uh, and it's becoming kind of a bit of, of a hot topic in computer vision as well. And it's mostly now dominated by contrastive methods, but I think uh, the architectural methods are going to take over because contrastive methods don't scale very well. So this is sort of, you know, giving you weapons for the future, if you want, understanding what this is all about. Um, okay, now for something completely different. This is something that Alfredo will like because he works on this project. And it's one of the uses, probably one of the most important uses of self-supervised learning is the uh, idea of uh, learning world models for control systems or for other purpose. So um, when, we, when humans or animals learn a, a task, uh, we quite obviously have a kind of good internal model of how the world works, of intuitive physics, of the fact that when a, an object is not supported, it falls. We've learned uh, gravity when we were babies, probably around the age of uh, nine months or so, eight or nine months. That's when it pops up in babies. Um, and we learn this mostly by observation. So how, how is it that we can learn how the world works and all the concepts about the world by observation? And there, there, are, there are two reasons for this, right? So one I already explained is the idea of self-supervised learning. If you can train yourself to predict, maybe you will spontaneously kind of learn abstract concepts about the world that might be useful uh, in preparation for learning a particular task uh, or a set of tasks. Uh, but there's another reason, which is that you actually want to build models of the world if you want to be able to act on the world, right? So. Um, I'm holding this pen and I know that if I uh, move my hand up, the, the pen will move with it because, you know, it's between my fingers. I know that if I open my fingers, the pen will fall. I know about gravity, I know about grasping. Uh, I've learned all that stuff and I've learned mostly by observation. I've learned also by experimentation, but a lot of what I learned, I learned just by observation. So the big question is, can we learn, can we uh, use uh, what we've learned about self-supervised learning to train a system um, to learn world models. Um, and what is a world model? Okay, so if you, if you want to sort of give the, an idea of the architecture of an autonomous intelligence system, um, it would be a system that is composed of essentially four major blocks here that are represented on the left. So it's an intelligent agent, or maybe not so intelligent, we'll see. Um, it has a perception module, and the perception module basically observes the world and then uh, computes a, a representation of the state of the world, okay? Um, called ST. At, at time T, S of T is the, the 
idea that the system has of the state of the world. This is necessarily an incomplete uh, representation of the world because we can't observe the entire universe at once. We only observe what's immediately around us. And even that we can't see through occlusions. And there is a lot of uh, you know, internal states about the world that we can't observe well enough. Even if you can observe, your accuracy of observation may not be uh, good enough. So if I put this pen in my, in my hand and it appears to be vertical and I let it go, it's gonna fall, but you can't really predict in what direction. I've used that example before uh, to describe the problem of uh, uh, aleatoric uh, uncertainty, which is the world is non-deterministic and you can't predict exactly what's gonna happen because you don't have a perfect reading of the state of the world. Uh, and maybe the world is intrinsically stochastic. Um, we don't know that actually. Okay, so a forward model is a model that given the current state of the world, S of T, or your idea of your current state of the world, and an action that you're taking or that someone else is taking, something that you can choose or at least observe, and perhaps an auxiliary latent variable Z of T, which represents what you don't know about the world, okay? So the part of the, the state of the world that you don't know or the, the thing that's unpredictable about what's gonna go, in, go on in the world. The forward model predicts the next state of the world, st plus one, okay? You discretize uh, time in, in some way. So if you have a, a model of the world uh, of that type, you can simulate in your head what's gonna happen as a consequence of your actions, okay? So you have this, uh, this model in your head. Uh, you know the current state of the world, or some idea of the current state of the world, you run your internal model of the world forward with a sequence of A of T, which is a sequence of action that you imagine uh, taking. And your model of the world, as you imagine it, will predict what's gonna happen in the world, okay? Um, if you could do this, then you could plan a sequence of actions that will arrive at a particular goal, okay? So for example, what sequence of, of action should I, uh, should I do to grab this pen? Um, you know, I should, you know, follow a, a particular trajectory, uh, you know, actuate my muscles in a particular way. So I grab this pen. Um, and the, the criterion, the, the, the cost function I can measure is, is whether I've grabbed the pen, okay? Whether the pen is in my grasp. Uh, I could measure this with some, some function, perhaps. And the question is, can I plan a sequence of action that given my model of the world, which in this case is the model of my hand and the model of where the pen is, uh, will allow me to grab it, okay? It's a little more complicated if I throw the pen and I have to catch it in the air, okay? Because I have to predict the trajectory of the pen. So I have to have uh, uh, an intuitive model of, uh, of physics to be able to uh, grab that pen, which of course I've learned through experience as well. People okay? are surprised you like so much reinforcement learning. This is not reinforcement learning. This has absolutely nothing to do with reinforcement learning. Let me be, let me be very clear. This has nothing to do with reinforcement learning. Uh, this may have to do in the future, okay? But right now it doesn't. Um, Model-based reinforcement learning. No, it doesn't. It has nothing to do with reinforcement learning. Let me, okay, let me, let me go through this a little bit. Can you explain the difference then? Someone yes, asking. I will. Um, in a minute. Okay, so now... Uh, so on the left here, you have this uh, little agent. It has this model of the world that it can run forward, okay? Uh, it, can, it has uh, an actor, or you can think of it as, as a policy that produces a sequence of actions, which it is gonna feed to the model. Uh, and then a critic, which is going to predict what the uh, cost of the final state or the trajectory is going to be according to the criterion. So the critic here computes the basically the cost of not fulfilling the goal that I set myself, okay? So if, I, if my task is to reach for this pen and I kind of miss the pen by a few centimeters, uh, my cost is a few centimeters. If I grab it, the cost is zero. If I miss it by a lot, the cost is higher, okay? That would be an example of a cost. Um, now, okay, so there, there is, uh, a number of different things you can do with uh, this sort of basic uh, model of uh, intelligent agent. So the first one is uh, you start from an initial state that you observe in the world, you run your forward model, you give a, a proposal for a sequence of actions, you measure the cost. And what you can do here, ignoring the, the, the P here, which represents a policy, um, let's, let's imagine it doesn't exist. 
by gradient descent or by some sort of optimization algorithm, you could, you could try to find a sequence of actions that will minimize the overall cost over the trajectory. I start from a state, I run my forward model, um, and it, it takes an action. Okay, let me just call this A1. This is S1 or S, yeah, S1. Uh, and this is gonna give me S2, and I'm gonna measure the cost of S2 through some cost function, C. Okay, and then next time step, running my forward model again, make an action, action proposal A2. This is all simulated, this is all in my head, right? Because this model, this forward model is in my head. It's in my frontal cortex. So I'm not actually doing this in the world. Etc. right? So I can enroll this for a few time steps. Those time steps can be milliseconds if I control muscles, they can be seconds if I control high level actions, they can be hours, okay? So if I wanna plan how to, I don't know, go to uh, San Francisco, you know, I need to get to the airports and then catch a plane and then when I arrive there, catch a taxi or something, etc. Okay, so this is independent of the, the level of which, level of description of the, of the thing. Okay, so what I can do with this is I can do a very classical uh, method called model predictive control. So it's a, a classical method of optimal control, which is a, a whole discipline that has been around since the, the 50s, if not, if not earlier. And some of the methods of method predictive controls goes, go back to the, the 1960s. There is something called the, the Kelly Bryson algorithm. I think it's Kelly with an E, I'm not sure. Um, so this is the, a method very similar to the one I'm, I'm describing at the moment. And this was used primarily by uh, NASA, let's say, to compute trajectories for rockets. Okay, so when they started having computers in the 60s uh, at NASA, they, they started computing trajectories with computers and they were basically using things like this. Before that, they had to do it by hand, okay? And if you haven't seen the movie uh, Hidden Figures, I, um, it describes how people were computing this by hand. This was mostly, do, mostly done by black women, black mathematicians, uh, women mathematicians. Uh, who also ended up kind of programming those computers. Watch that movie, it's, it's really great. Um, okay, so here is a basic idea here. Um, this looks very much like a recurrent net, okay? Because your forward model is basically the same network replicated over, over time. And this is like an unworld recurrent network. And so well, what you do here is you back propagate the value of the cost through this entire network all the way to the actions and you don't use this for training, you use this for inference. You think of the actions as latent variables and you basically by gradient descent or some other optimization method, you find a sequence of actions that will minimize the sum of the cost over the trajectory, okay? Um, so basically you have uh, an overall cost, um, I'm gonna call it big C and that's gonna be the sum over time steps, time steps of the little c of uh, st, okay? Uh, and what you're gonna do is big A, which is the sequence of A, is gonna be replaced by its own value minus uh, some uh, step size times the gradient of big C with respect to A. Okay, so as long as you can compute the gradient of the sum of those costs over the trajectory with respect to all of the components of A, which means the, A, the trajectories of A, uh, you can do this optimization. You don't have to do it necessarily through gradient descent. In some cases, there are more efficient ways to do this optimization uh, uh, using dynamic programming, for example. If A is discrete, that might be more efficient. But, you can, but if A is continuous and high dimensional, you basically have no choice but to use gradient-based methods. Okay, so this is inference. It's not, there's no learning yet. What is A 
Big A is the sequence A1, A2, A3, etc. Okay? So you have a differentiable objective function, and you can minimize it with respect to the variables you're interested in. So what do you get out of this? There are no weights in A. A is a vector, no. right? So A is a vector, yeah. Yeah, so that was actually, because we never use, uh, we never minimize vectors so far. We always been minimizing, no, uh, we, we are have. always been optimizing weights, so people are no, confused. we have. For okay. uh, latent um, variables, like the Z variables, the latent variables of EB, uh, energy-based models, the latent variables, we do minimize the energy with respect to Z. So this is the same problem here we're solving. I think, yeah, I think not everyone understood that the latent variables are actually inputs. So that was, I think, like a, also misunderstanding with the uh, question we had on Piazza about training these, lat uh, these uh, latent variable models. Yeah, you don't want to use the word training for latent variables or for things like this uh, because uh, you want to use inference, okay? You want to use the word to infer or to, not to train. I want to use the word inference, not training. What's the difference between inference and training? Uh, training... With training, you learn a, a, a parameter uh, that is the same for a large number of samples, okay? For inference, you find the value of some variable, a latent variable, A in this case, Z in the case of a latent variable energy-based model, uh, that is specific to one sample, okay? You change the sample, the latent variable changes. So you don't learn it because you don't remember it from one, 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 one time to the next. You know, there's no memory for it, right? Um, so that's the difference. You know, conceptually, you're doing the same kind of operation where you do learning and inference. And so at some level of abstraction, they're the same. But uh, inference, you do it per sample. Learning, you do it uh, over a bunch of samples. And you, the parameter is shared across the samples. When we have an energy-based model and we'd like to do inference, we still have a minimization to do at every time we perform these, uh, we use right. it, right? right? So that was a big difference between... After, you, right, so after you've trained the model, when you use it, you, you still have to do minimization with respect to the latent variables, okay? So that's the, that's the big difference. Same here. Here, uh, there may or may not be any training. Your forward model may be built by hand or may be trained, but by the time we're here, it's, it's trained. We're not training anything here. We're just doing inference. We're figuring out what is the optimal value of the sequence of A's that will minimize our, uh, our cost, overall cost. And this is an inference problem, just like energy-based models. For example, the FM, the four model, can be just uh, one line of equation of physics, right? It can be just a deterministic right. equation. So imagine the forward model is the few equations that describe the, the, uh, the, the physics of a, of a rocket. And A is basically the action on the, the steering, you know, how you orient the nozzles and then the, the thrust. Um, so that would be the, the collection of A, would be the collection of those variables. And then there is, you know, very simple physics, Newtonian physics, basically. Uh, you can write the equations. It will give you the state of the rocket at the next uh, time step uh, as a function of the state of the rocket at the previous time step and the actions you're taking. That's how you do simulations. That's how every simulator uh, works. Um, and then your cost function, if you want to shoot a rocket, would be maybe a combination of two things. One uh, would be the, the uh, energy spent during that time step, okay, the amount of fuel you spent, something like that. And the second term might be the distance to a target you want to reach. Maybe you want to rendezvous with a space station, and uh, the, the second term in the cost would be the distance to the space station, okay, square of distance to the space station. Uh, if you measure the... Um, the sum over the entire trajectory of the distance to the space station, the system will try to minimize the time it will take to get to the space station because it will want to minimize the sum of the square of the distances to the space station over the trajectory. But at the same time, it wants to minimize fuel, so you have to balance those two terms, right? So that's a classical way of doing optimal control, and that's called model predictive control. Uh, is model is Kalman filtering one type of model predictive control? No, Kalman filtering is a particular uh, forward model, if you want. It's a way of estimating the state of the world. Okay, but um, it's you know basically given your observation of the state of the world through a perception system, there's going to be some uncertainty about the state of the world, and the Kalman filter basically assumes a Gaussian distribution on this uncertainty. Um, and now, when you run through your forward model, 
you're going to have a resulting uncertainty about the state of the world at the next time step because you, it wasn't certain to start with. Okay. So given the uncertainty when you started from, where you started from, what's the uncertainty after one step of physics, if you want? Uh, and if you assume linearity of all those steps and Gaussianity of the uncertainty, that's what a, that's what a, uh, a common filter is. Um, most of the uncertainty comes from, okay, so now, now your forward model produces a prediction and at the next time step, you might get another reading of the state of the world because your sensors are still working. So now you have two Gaussians. One is uh, your new perception of the world tells you here is where I think the state of the world is. And your forward model also predicted, here's where I think it, what, where I think it is. And you have to combine those two. That's where the, comp the complexity of Kalman filtering comes in, which is uh, I've got two Gaussian predictions. So the resulting probability distribution is also a Gaussian. I have to compute the covariance matrix and et cetera. And that's where the, the formulas for um, Kalman filters come from. Okay, so Kalman filter is a way to deal with the uncertainty in the reading your perception of the world and in the, uh, 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 when, when you propagate those, this uncertainty in your forward model. Uh, I think there was still a main difference. Uh, I think you wanted to address the point that the, this is different from RL. Okay, so what is RL in that context? Okay, so, okay, bef I, need, I, need, I need one more step before I talk about RL. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and here is that step. Okay, so what we had uh, just a minute ago was a forward model that's unrolled in time. And the system has, takes a sequence of actions, A1, A2, a3, uh, S1, S2, and then we have the cost function here coming out. Okay, and this, this could go on, right? Now, what we'd like to be able to do is not have to do this optimization with respect to A1, A2, A3, A4 uh, every time. Every time we need to do a planning, we don't wanna have to do the, to the, go through this complex process of backpropagating a uh, gradient through this entire system to do model predictive uh, 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 control. And so a simple, a simple way to get rid of, of that step is the same trick that we use in autoencoders versus sparse coding. So remember it's sparse coding, we wanted to uh, reconstruct, but then we had to do inference with respect to the latent variable by optimization. And that turned out to be, uh, to be expensive. So what we talked about last week was the idea of using an encoder that we train to predict the optimal value directly. Okay, and we're gonna do the same here. And that resulted in the idea of sparse autoencoder. We're gonna do the same here. We're gonna train a network to take the state and directly predict what the optimal value of the action is. And this network, of course, we're going to apply every time step. And this is gonna be called a policy network. Okay, so the policy network takes the state and produces a guess uh, about the best action to take at, at, at this time, so as to minimize the overall cost, okay? And this is gonna be a trainable neural net or whatever model, parameterized model that we want. The way we're gonna train this model is basically just by back propagation, okay? So we're going to, uh, using our perception module, this is, this, is the, this is the world here. And we're looking at the world with a camera and there is a perception module that gives us a guess as to what the state of the world is. Okay, this is perception. And this is our forward model applied multiple time steps. And this is our cost. Okay, so what we can do is run this system. Um, and to run this system, we first um, 
run through the perception, we compute an, ac uh, an action, we run this action through the forward model. This forward model gives us, here is the next state we're gonna be in, compute the cost, and then keep going, okay? Keep doing this, just forward prop through this entire system, which is really kind of an unworld recurrent net if you want. And once you're done, you back propagate gradient, gradients uh, from the, all the terms in the cost function all the way through the network, all the way through the parameters of that policy network, okay? So basically you compute uh, D of big C, so big C, remember, is the sum of all the Cs of a, uh, a long time, with respect to DW, okay? And that's just gonna be the sum over time of uh, D of big C over DW, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, big C over D A T D A T over D W. Okay, I just applied chain rule, right? But I, I don't need to, right? If I just you know define this function in PyTorch and I just do backprop, it'll, ju it'll just do the right thing. Um, so I can compute the gradient of the overall cost with respect to the parameters of that policy network. And so if I train this over sufficiently many uh, uh, samples, if my forward model is correct, if my cost function does what I want, then my policy network is going to learn a good policy that just looking at the state will minimize the expected cost over a trajectory, okay? The average cost over a trajectory. There's no reinforcement learning here. This is all backdrop, okay? Now we can talk about the difference with reinforcement learning. The main difference with reinforcement learning here is, uh, is, is twofold. The first one is in reinforcement learning, uh, in most reinforcement learning scenarios, at least, the, um, the C function is a black box. Well, it's a black box, not a red box. Okay. That's the first difference. The second difference is that this is not a forward model of the world. This is the real world. And your measure of the state of the world is imperfect. So inside of this policy network, you might have a perception network here that estimates the state of the world. So you have no control over the real world and your cost function is not known, you can, you can just get the output of the cost function by just trying something, right? You take an action, you see the effect on the world, and that gives you uh, what reinforcement learning people call a reward, but it's just a negative cost, okay? It's the value of, negative value of your cost, uh, but the cost is not differentiable. You don't know the function of the cost, you have to go through the world to figure out the value of the cost, okay? Um, and that's the, that's, that's the main issue with reinforcement learning, which is that the cost function is not differentiable. Uh, it's, it's unknown. The only way to estimate it is by trying something and then observing the value, which is what the reward is, really. It's a negative. The negative of the reward is basically your, your cost, okay? Um, so in that situation, since you cannot evaluate gradients, um, to minimize your cost, you have to try multiple things. You have to try an action, see the result, and then try another action, see if the result is better. And then try another action, see if the result is better. And if your cost function is very flat, and you have to try many, many things before you get a, a non-zero reward or you know, a non-high cost. Uh, and so that's, that's where the, the complexity goes. There is the additional problem of exploration. So, um, you know, you, you, because you don't know the, the form of the, of the cost and because it's non-differentiable, uh, you might need to kind of try many actions in kind of a smart way to figure out in which part of the space to go to be able to sort of figure out how can I improve my, uh, my performance, okay? So that's the, the main issue uh, of uh, uh, exploration. And then there is the issue of uh, exploration versus exploitation. So the fact that, um, when you're on your situation, you don't want to take completely random actions because they're likely to not result in anything interesting. So you want to take actions that are kind of close to what you think might work. 
uh, and sort of, you know, uh, occasionally kind of try something else uh, while, while you're learning and learn your policy as you go. What I'm describing, what I was describing just before is a situation where you can do all of this in your head because you have a, a model of the world and you can optimize your sequence of action very efficiently because you have a differentiable cost function. Your cost function is computed by your, your own brain, if you want, inside of your agent. Uh, you can tell if you, grab the, if you grab the pen, you can tell the distance between your hand and the pen. So you can compute your own cost function. And it, it is kind of, in your internal world model, is differentiable. In the real world, it's not. In the real world, you don't know the derivative of the distance of your hand to the pen, unless you have some model of that in your head. But uh, by default, you don't. But because everything is in your head, everything is differentiable. Everything is in, implemented by a neural net and everything, you can backpropagate gradient to everything. So that's the big advantage of this kind of approach versus reinforcement learning, okay? Make everything differentiable. So there's two problems with the world. So there's one big advantage in this kind of, this kind of scenario, uh, which is you can run this faster than real time because your forward model inside of your agent can run as fast as you want. You don't need to run through the world, okay? That's one advantage. Second advantage is the actions you're taking will not kill you because you can predict uh, using your forward model, you know, maybe you'll predict that the action will kill you, but you're not gonna take it in the real world. So it won't kill you if you have an accurate forward model. Uh, third advantage, because everything takes place in your head, everything is a neural net, everything is differentiable. You can use all kinds of efficient uh, learning or, or um, uh, inference algorithms to uh, figure out a, a good course of actions, okay? So that's the difference with, with reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, you're telling yourself, I have to go through the real world. Uh, I don't have a model of the real world. I don't know how to compute the cost function in a differentiable way. That said, a lot of reinforcement learning methods actually work by training a model of the cost function. Okay, so actor critic methods, basically, the role of the critic uh, is to learn, to evaluate, to kind of predict the value of the overall objective function, the expected value of the objective function. And because it's a, it's a neural net that you're gonna train, you can backpropagate gradient to it. So you're basically learning an approximation of the cost function of the real world, uh, of the real world using, uh, using a neural net. That's, that's the role of a critic. Okay, why is it so good to have uh, models uh, when you're learning a, um, a skill, like uh, learning to drive, for example? Um, it's basically what allows you to learn quickly and to learn without killing yourself. So if you don't have a good model of the world, you don't know about gravity, you don't know about the dynamics of objects, uh, you don't know anything, and you put an agent at the, at the wheel of a car, the agent has no idea what the physics of a car is, okay? And you put the car next to a cliff. The car is driving at, you know, 30 miles an hour next to, next to a cliff. The agent doesn't have a model of the world, has no idea that by turning the wheel to the right, the car will run off a cliff and will fall into the, into the ravine. It has to actually try it to figure it out. It has to fall into the ravine to figure out that this is a bad idea, okay? And maybe just from one sample, it's not gonna be able to learn it. So it's gonna to have to run into the ravine like thousands of times before it figures out the model of the world that first turning the wheel to the right makes the car go to the right. And second, that when the car goes above a ravine, it falls into a ravine and destroys itself. Okay, if you have a model of the world that understands about gravity and things like this, then you know that turning the wheel to the right is gonna make the car veer to the ravine and you don't do it because you know it's gonna kill you. Okay, so it allows humans and animals to learn quickly much, much quicker than any uh, uh, model-free reinforcement learning uh, methods that has ever been devised is, is the fact that we have very, very good word models in our head, okay? Now, what does that tell us? Um, okay, so here is the problem with, with the world. The world is not deterministic, or if it is deterministic, it's so complex that it equally well could be non-deterministic. It doesn't make any difference for, it, for us. Um, there's two problems with predicting the next state of the world. The first problem is uh, that the world is not entirely predictable. 
And it could be not entirely predictable for two reasons. Those are called aleatoric uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty. Aleatoric uncertainty is due to the fact that the world is intrinsically uh, unpredictable or the fact that we don't have full information about the state of the world, so we cannot predict exactly what's going to happen next. So you're looking at me right now. You have a pretty good model of the immediate environment of, of me, okay? But you cannot exactly predict in which way I'm going to move my head next because you don't have an accurate model of what's inside my skull, okay? Your perceptual system uh, does not give you a full model of uh, how my brain functions, uh, unfortunately. Um, so, um, so you cannot exactly predict what I'm, you know, what I'm going to do next, what I'm going to say, how I'm going to move my head, etc. Um, so that's uh, aleatoric uh, uncertainty. There is also epistemic uncertainty. And epistemic uncertainty is the fact that you can't completely predict the next uh, state of the world because the amount of training data you've had is not, was not enough. Your model hasn't been trained enough to really kind of figure it out, okay? And that's kind of a different uh, type of uncertainty. So the big question now is, though, how do we train models of the world under uncertainty? I give you an ST. Can you predict ST plus one? And it's the same problem we encountered before with our supervised learning. I give you an X. Can we predict Y? But the problem is that there are now multiple Ys that are compatible with X. There are multiple ST plus ones that are compatible with S, even for a given action. Um, so what does that mean? That means that our model here, our forward model, may take the state of the world and an action, but it will also have to take a latent variable, which we don't know the value of to predict the next state. Okay? And this looks very much like what we talked about earlier, where we had, I'm going to draw this in a different topology, but it's the same idea. Um, so we had uh, X, and it was going through uh, a predictor, computing H, and then that was going through a decoder that will take into account a latent variable to predict Y bar, and then we observe Y. Okay, this is a prediction for S, and maybe uh, at some time, we might be able to actually take the action and observe the next state of the world. While we are training our model, we'll actually be observing the next state of the world, T plus one. Okay, so to train a forward model here, we, we take the state ST, we take an action if we have an action, um, we have a latent variable, and our prediction goes into a cost function. That diagram is exactly identical to the one on the right. Right, it's the same, it's exactly the same diagram, except I split the FM into two modules, Okay, I give, I've given it a, a particular uh, architecture. In fact, I could make this uh, more explicit. I think you have the super thick marker selected. I do, yes. <laughs> you don't like that, huh? <laughs> so this would be my forward model. Okay, so that's what inside this box, uh, inside the, the forward model box here is this. Um, and, you know, I renamed uh, uh, ST is now called X and ST plus one is now called Y bar, but I mean, it's not called Y, but it's the same thing otherwise, right? So it's the same scenario that we talked about before in uh, latent variable energy-based models, essentially. But now we're going to use this to train uh, a forward model to predict what's going to happen in the world. So... <clears throat> um, we may have to play the same tricks that, that we played, uh, that we talked about uh, last week, which is that um, last week what we explained was that uh, we can take, okay, the way I drew this last week was slightly different. Um, 
what I explained last week is that we can, uh, if we have, while we are training our forward model, we have a pair X and Y. Um, and the way we find the value of Z is by minimizing the energy with respect to Z, right? So we basically find Z star, which is the argument of C of Y and Y bar, Y bar being the output of our, of our predictor, of our, of our system. Okay. And then we do one step of gradient descent. So we change the parameters of uh, our entire system according to the gradient of uh, that cost. But for this to work, we had to regularize Z, limit its information content. And we have to do the same here. Why is that? Well, here we're, we're, we're trying to solve a prediction problem, but imagine, uh, and we talked about this uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I give you an X and a Y and you find the Z that minimizes the overall energy and the Z is not regularized. If Z is the same dimension as Y, they, they, there's probably gonna be a Z for any Y that makes the cost function zero, right? If there's enough capacity in Z, there's always gonna be a value of Z that makes the cost function zero. And that's bad because that means my energy function is gonna be completely flat. It's gonna be zero everywhere and I need it to be small on the training samples and high outside of the region of high data density. And what we saw in the last couple of weeks is that by regularizing Z, limiting its capacity, either by uh, making it sparse, for example, or making it discrete, or by uh, um, making it noisy, um, then we can limit its capacity. Why do we need ZT if you already have AT? Well, so AT is the action you take, right? Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let this pen go, okay? But you don't know in which direction it's gonna, it's gonna go, right? So let's say it goes this way, but I have to predict in advance which way it's gonna go. It's like, okay, here's a better situation. You are, uh, uh, you are a goalie playing soccer. Okay, and it's a penalty kick. So you're in front of the, you know, the kicker in front of you and the guy is gonna kick the ball and you're gonna to have to jump one way or the other. And you have to make a choice, am I jumping left or right? And you have to make that decision based on what you observe from the person, but you don't know exactly what the ball is gonna do. A is which direction you, do, you jump in. I mean, it's basically how you jump. Z is what you don't know about the player in front of you doing. Okay, you don't know the state of the world. You don't know the state of the brain of this guy. And so you don't know if he's gonna shoot left or right or up or down. Okay, that's the difference, right? Z is what you cannot know about the world that is necessary to make the prediction of the next state. A is the action you take, which in this case has very little influence on the immediate state of the world. Yeah, it seems, it seems to be clear now. Right. So. You need to regularize Z. And then one of the tricks we, uh, we described, um, so, so the, one of the things we described to regularize Z was, was sparsity, another one was adding noise. Um, but, but the other trick we described is this idea of having an encoder, right? So you have X or ST run through the predictor, the predictor goes into the decoder, which makes a prediction about Y, let's call it Y bar. And you compare, oops, sorry. You compare Y bar to Y. And here you have Z. And what we talked about is the idea of using an encoder here to predict the optimal value of Z, and then basically having a cost function that uh, is determining the energy that measures the discrepancy between the value of Z you actually use and the value of Z predicted by the encoder. And perhaps this is regularized in some way. Um, and the predictor also has to influence the encoder. 
So it's pretty clear that you need uh, an information bottleneck uh, uh, between the encoder and the decoder. Otherwise, the system will cheat. It will completely ignore X. It will be able to predict Y exactly by just cheating, by looking at the value of Y, running it through the encoder, and then running it through the decoder, and then predicting Y, right? That's just a very simple autoencoder. So unless you restrict the capacity of Z, the system will just cheat and not actually train itself to predict. You have to push down on the information content uh, of Z so as to force the system to use uh, the information uh, from X, okay? To make the, the best prediction. Okay, now we can use that trick to, to, uh, uh, to train a forward model. Because again, uh, a forward model is basically just an instance of this. And, and this is uh, the, a project that uh, uh, for autonomous driving that uh, a former student, Mikhail Enaf, uh, worked on. And uh, Alfredo has worked uh, on this and is still working on this project. And so here, uh, you're trying to train a, a car to drive itself. And what's difficult to predict is what, the, is what the car around you are going to do. So you place a camera above a highway and you watch the, the cars kind of go by. And you can track every car and then extract the immediate neighborhood of the car, basically a little rectangle around every car that indicates where the other cars are relative to, the, to your car. And this is what represent, what's represented at the bottom. Um, so at the bottom, you, you have a little rectangle that's centered around a given car. And then all the cars around are the, uh, you know, a little rectangle centered on that car where the car is in a standardized location in the middle of that uh, rectangle. And you do this for every car. What it gives you is for every car, a sequence of what the cars around it are going to do. And we can use this to train a forward model that will predict what the cars around us are going to do. The so, question is, if this forward model is predicting all possible futures, uh, irrespective of the action taken. Yeah. Where we predict a set of futures, so given one action and given, uh, so, uh, so given one initial state, one action, and one, set, one particular value of the latent variable, it will make a single prediction. And then you can vary the latent variable and it will make multiple predictions. You can change the action, of course, right? So I've, I've redrawn the little diagram I, I drew previously here. Here, the, the state basically is a, a sequence of three frames from this video. Um, there's no abstract state here. It's just the, the picture itself. The, the blue car is, is our car, and the green cars are the other cars. So you take kind of three frames from the past, run this through this uh, uh, neural net, which attempts to predict the next uh, the next frame, okay, using a, uh, basically a, a big convolutional net as a predictor and a big convolutional net as a decoder. But there's a latent variable here. There's also an action here, which is not drawn, uh, that gets into this. Um, and the system also has an encoder. <clears throat> so it looks more like this. Uh, there's a, and again, the action here is not represented, but um, imagine there is one. So X is the, the past frames. It goes through a predictor that predicts a representation of the input. And then that representation uh, goes into uh, a convolutional net that uh, a decoder that predicts, it basically is combined additively with a latent variable. So it's added to a latent variable uh, before going into a decoder that makes a prediction for the next state. And the latent variable itself is, is a latent variable, but um, is being predicted by, uh, by an encoder, uh, which itself is also a convolutional net. It takes the past and the, and the future and tries to predict the ideal value of the latent variable. Now, of course, you have to restrict the information content here. And this is done in this particular project using sort of a VAE-like approach, where the, uh, I mean, it's basically a, a VAE uh, with a few, a few tricks. So Z is sampled from a distribution that is obtained uh, from the output of the encoder. The output of the encoder outputs a prediction for Z bar as well as prediction for variances. And Z is sampled from, the, from that distribution. So it's not optimized, it's sampled. Um, but there's also a term that tries to kind of minimize the sum of the squares of, of the Zs over time. 
uh, which is the, the standard uh, technique for VAE. And that goes into the decoder. And so this is trained as a conditional autoencoder, basically. There's another trick that's uh, added to this, which is that uh, half the time, Z is simply set to zero. So half the time the system is told, you're not allowed to use Z. Just make your best guess as the prediction without a Z. And that drives the system to sort of really kind of use the past in sort of a bigger way than if you just uh, uh, have a noisy Z. If you just use the standard VAE type training, the, the system basically ignores the, the past. It just cheats. It looks at the, at the, at the answer Y. I will cover the rest in a greater detail in a lab, in a future lab. Uh, perhaps you want to uh, say something about the uh, GANs in the so like, latest part. The GANs. Because yes. I, I will be actually going over this, uh, the whole presentation Indeed as well. You are. So GANs are, are a, a particular form of contrastive learning. Okay, so remember that uh, when we talked about energy-based learning, we have uh, data points And our model, which I'm going to draw like this, uh, with a cost function. It could have any kind of structure, but I'm, I'm just going to draw it like this. So this would be sort of a reconstruction type um, uh, model, right? So imagine that the model here is, is an autoencoder or something like this. But you can imagine just about, just about anything. Um, a simplified version, I mean, a more general version of this would be just y goes into a cost function and I'm not specifying what that cost function looks like, OK? Um, so what that cost function computes is uh, in the space of y. So let's say y is two-dimensional. Is an energy that we want to be low on the data and high outside the data. And here I deliberately drew a bad energy function, right? So this energy function is bad because uh, it should be low around this region where we have data and it should be higher outside. And right now it's, it's pretty low in, in, the, in this region right here. So we've talked about contrastive methods and contrastive methods consist in taking a sample and pushing down on its energy and then taking a contrastive sample, which I'm gonna draw in purple. So contrastive sample should be a sample that our model already gives low energy to, but should not give low energy to. I'm going to push that up, okay? So push up on the energy of this guy, push down on the energy of that guy. And if you keep picking those samples and those contrastive samples well, uh, by minimizing some objective function that wants to make the energy of the blue point small and the energy of the pink points uh, high, then the system will we'll learn properly. So we've seen several ways of generating contrastive samples. The idea of denoising autoencoder, which is to take a sample and basically corrupt it in some way. We've seen the idea of um, uh, contrastive divergence, which takes a sample and then you go down the energy with some noise and that gives you a contrastive sample to push up. Um, and you know we've seen uh, a number of other methods that are based on prior knowledge about similarity between uh, between samples. But here is here is another idea. The other idea is to use is to train a neural net to produce those contrastive samples intelligently, and that's the basic idea of GANs, at least in a form of GANs that, that uh, would be called energy-based GANs. Because there's several formulations of GANs. In fact, there's an entire laundry list of various types of GANs. Um, but the basic idea of GANs is is that you you train your energy model. So the energy model in the context of GAN is called a discriminator or sometimes a critic, but it's basically just very similar to an energy model. And you train it to take low energy on the data points, and then you 
train another net, net, neural net to generate contrastive data points and you move their energy up, okay? So the overall uh, diagram is something like this. You have uh, a discriminator and the discriminator really should be not drawn this way. It could be a large neural net, but in the end, oops, sorry. Uh, in the end, it's just a cost function. Okay, so it takes, it takes a variable y and it tells you it's good or bad. Low energy if it's good, high energy if it's bad. So in one phase, you collect a piece of data from, the, from your data set and you just give it to your discriminator. Okay, so this is a real y coming from data. That's a training sample. And you say the output of, uh, of that should go down, okay? I should really write this as F because after all, it's just, it's an energy function. Okay, so make F of Y go down. Of course, by changing the parameters, right? So you do W replaced by W minus eta DF. So F is a neural net. F is a neural net. Okay. Some parameterized function, but probably a neural net. Probably a pretty complicated neural net. Okay, that's the first uh, first thing. And that will make the energy of data points small. Okay. Now there's a form of this that's conditional. So the form of this as conditional, you have an extra input here which is an observation, okay? But you can have this or not. That's called conditional again, doesn't matter. Okay, second phase or for contrastive samples. Uh, you have a latent variable Z that you sample from some distribution, a distribution that's easy to sample from, let's say a Gaussian, multi, multivariate Gaussian or uniform or something. You run this through what's called a generator so this is a neural net and that neural net produces something similar to Y, okay? It just produces an image, let's say, if Y are images. And again, you run this through your discriminator. But now you want to make that large, okay? So in fact, what I told you before, is a lie, uh, you don't do this update like that. Okay, but here, what you want is you want to make FW of this Y bar high, okay? And what you're gonna do now is train the discriminator and the generator simultaneously. So you're gonna ha first have to come up with a cost function, a loss function. Uh, and this loss function is going to be, you know, some, um, you know, some of a sample of a per sample loss function that um, basically is a function of uh, F of Y and F of Y bar where y bar, of course, is generated from the randomly sampled latent variable z. Now, this cost function needs to be a decreasing function of f of y and in, in, an increasing function of f of y bar, okay? You can use just about any cost function you want as long as it makes f of y decrease and it makes f of y bar increase, or as long as it makes a difference uh, uh, decrease, f of y minus f of y bar. Good example of this, uh, would be kind of a hinge loss, for example, okay? So something that says my loss function is going to be um, f of y uh, plus some margin minus f of y bar 
positive part. Okay, so this is a this is a hinge, and it says I want to make f of y bar smaller than um, m. Um, other than that, I don't care. Uh, bigger than m. I'm sorry. Uh, I drew this backwards. So overall, as a function of f of y bar, this function looks like this, okay? So it wants to make f of y bar larger than m. Okay, so that's an example. The, the actual cost function that most, uh, the original formulation of GANs used basically plugs uh, each of those terms into a sigmoid and tries to make the you know, the, the sigmoid applied to f of y as close to one as possible and sigmoid applied to f uh, of y bar as close to zero as possible. It's, you know, it's basically that, nothing more than that. So it's sigmoid of f of y plus one minus sigmoid of uh, f of y bar. And you, you, you take logs because, um, I mean, this is not the last function. This is kind of what goes before, be, be, before the loss function. So this is kind of like a cross entropy, but you have a cross entropy that's positive for the, the, the positive phase and sort of the, the target is negative for the negative phase. Um, yeah, I shouldn't write it this way. This is wrong actually. Sorry about that. But you put it a logistic loss for each of those. So it's, Technically, you know, log, log of one plus exponential f of y for the correct one and uh, minus for that log of one plus e to the f of y plus log one plus e to the minus f of y bar. Um, but you could imagine a large number of objective functions of this type. Um, okay. So this is the loss function you're going to use to train the discriminator. But the generator, this is for the discriminator. But it's going to be a loss function for the generator, and that's a different loss function. And you're going to optimize those two loss functions the same way. The one for the generator is, is one that basically wants to make the generator produce outputs that the discriminator thinks are good, but they're not, okay? So basically the, gen the generator um, uh, wants to uh, adapt its, its weight so that the output that it produces, y bar, uh, produces a low energy for f of y, okay? So you sample a random variable z, you run it through the generator, it produces a y bar, you run through the discriminator, the f of y, you get some value, and then you back propagate the value through the generator and adapt the weights of the generator so that um, this energy goes down. Okay, so basically the generator is trying to find a Y bar that has low energy, as low as possible. Okay, and it trains itself to kind of produce Ys that have low energy. Again, if, if we're talking about um, conditional GANs, there's gonna be an X variable that's going to enter those two modules, but that makes no difference in the end. So LG is uh, maybe simply an increasing function uh, of uh, f of y bar. I think we are kind of running out of time. We are. We have run out of time. So this would be uh, some objective function of f of G, if G is a generator of Z, where Z is sample randomly. Okay, so you, you just do backprop to this. 
and you change the parameters of uh, G, let's call them U, um, so that this goes down. Now, this is, called, this is called a game in a sense that you have two objective functions that you need to minimize simultaneously and they are incompatible with each other. And so it's not a gradient descent problem. You have to find uh, what's called a Nash equilibrium between those two functions. Uh, and gradient descent will not do it uh, by default. So that leads to instabilities and there is tons of papers on how to make GANs actually work. That's kind of a complicated part, but Alfredo will tell you all about this uh, tomorrow. Maybe you also, you want to mention the, uh, the one with the sigmoid that creates some issues uh, if we have like samples that are close to the true manifold. Yes. And then okay. I think we can close the lesson. We can close that. Okay, so let me mention that. So let's imagine that your data, um, so again, uh, energy-based framework, your data is around some manifold, but it's a thin manifold. So it's an infinitely thin distribution. Okay. Uh, in the original formulation of GAN, the, the GAN, the discriminator would need to produce uh, zero probability outside of this. Okay, so it needs to produce zero probability here. And it needs to produce on the manifold, it needs to produce infinite probability in such a way that the integral, if this is really a density estimation, in such a way that the integral of the density over the entire space is one. And this is, of course, very hard. Um, so GANs basically abandon the idea of actually learning a distribution. What they want to do is produce zero, uh, the original formulation, produce zero outside the manifold of data and produce one here. It's the output of a sigmoid that needs to be one, which means the weighted sum going into that sigmoid needs to be infinite, essentially. So it's not that different. Um, and the problem with this is that if you train the system successfully and you get that energy function, which is zero outside the data manifold and one on the data manifold, your energy function is completely useless. It's useless because it's a golf course, right? It's flat. So the energy function basically that corresponds to this would be the negative log of that, right? So it would be, uh, it would be infinity here and the minimum value of your cost function on the manifold, which for example, could be zero if, it, if, it's, if it's an autoencoder, the energy can be smaller than zero, right? Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a golf course of infinite altitude, which is really not that useful. What you want, as I said before, for every energy-based model, if you want an energy-based model to be useful, you want the energy function to be smooth. You don't want it to go to infinity in sort of very small uh, step. You want it to be smooth so that you can do inference so that if, if you start from a point here, it's easy to find uh, a point on the manifold that's nearby using gradient descent, for example, right? So the original formulation of GAN leads to, uh, f first of all, infinite weights in the discriminator instabilities, something called mode collapse, which Alfredo will tell you about. Um, and in the end, uh, a contrast function, an energy function that's essentially useless. So it's not ideally formulated. So people have uh, proposed ways to fix it by regularizing the energy function, basically forcing it to be smooth. So one good example of this is uh, something called wasserstein gans proposed by uh, uh, Martin Arjowski, who just graduated from NYU, and Leon Botou and a few other people. Um, and, uh, and the idea of, uh, of that is to basically limit the size of the weights of the discriminator so that the function is smooth. And there is you know, various mathematical arguments uh, in probabilistic framework, but that's the basic idea. And there's lots of variations of this also. Uh, questions about uh, today's class? It was dense, but at least we were, you know, uh, answering every question. It was coming right. through. So I think we we follow along today. Um, I wasn't sure if maybe you like explained it in a different form, and I didn't realize it's the same thing. But I was a little um, lost on what the policy network is. 
Okay. What that does. So the policy network takes the estimation of the state of the world and produces an action. And it's trained to minimize the expected cost of uh, the state over the over a trajectory, but it takes just one action. Okay. So right, and there, there was a there, there was a part towards the end where I guess you drew a new connection, um, right? That uh, from like S to uh, where it goes down. To, like connected through some module to A. So what is happening there? So the policy network is the indicated by pi here on the screen. Mm -hmm. okay. So it takes S, the state, and it produces an action. Okay. Okay. Huh. Okay. That's what a policy is, right? You observe the state of the world and you take an action. I see. Okay. In fact, a probabilistic policy is you don't take an action, you give a, a distribution over actions and then you pick the action in some way mm -hmm. from that distribution. But here, you know, you just have to take an action. If, if the number of actions is discrete, then uh, this, this pi network is, this policy network is basically a classifier and it produces a bunch of scores for each possible action. And then you take one of the actions, probabilistically or deterministically. Deterministically, you just take the, action with the highest score. Uh, probabilistically, you can uh, sample according to, to the score. And then you run through your fraud model and you keep going. Okay, so without the policy connection, then, then the action is just kind of... Is a latent variable. So you have to optimize with respect to the latent variable to find, uh, to find its optimal value. So you have this, this kind of uh, diagram now mm -hmm. where the actions are not produced by a neural net. They, they are latent variables that you have to figure out for every new, every, every time you run your model, you have, you have to figure out what's the best sequence of action to minimize my cost. Mm -hmm. And so you have to basically uh, do, do this, for example, by gradient descent, figuring out the sequence of A that will minimize the sum of the Cs over the trajectory. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's called model predictive control. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> the one with the policy network, um, is, is, is called, uh, uh, you know, direct uh, control, essentially. Um, professor, uh, you say that during inference, we need to uh, minimize or to see the energy to get the final value. But, uh, okay, there are two questions. One, won't it take too much time during inference and would it be useful for real-time systems? And the second one is, um, since it's unrolled and you have to backpropagate all the way through the beginning, yeah. uh, would it have all the problems that we face in uh, recurrent neural networks? Exactly. So uh, presumably you're not going to get the same problems as you have with recurrent nets because your forward model, you know, presumably implements the dynamics of some real system. So it might not have the issues of sort of non-invertibility that you have. If it's a physical system, it's probably going to be reversible, so you, you may not have the same issue as with regular recurrent nets, but, uh, but yeah, you're facing the same, the same problems. Now, uh, in real time situations, you, you use a form of this called uh, receding horizon planning. Okay, so receding horizon planning uh, is when you are in a sort of real-time situation, uh, your, your system will run its forward model for a few steps in the future. I don't know, let's say a few seconds. Okay, sufficiently many steps to predict for a few seconds. That's your horizon. Uh, then you do this uh, model predictive control you know, by optimizing, finding the optimal A that minimizes your cost, your estimated cost according to your model, okay? You're not, you haven't taken an action yet, okay? You've just run your internal model to make that prediction. Um, so through optimization with respect to A, you find the sequence of A that optimizes your cost, and then you take the first action in that A, and then you do it again, okay? So with the A you took, observe the state of the world now, you have a new state, okay? Which you observe from your, your, your sensors. And now repeat the process. 
run your forward model a number of steps in the future, optimize the sequence of actions to minimize your cost, take the first action and do it again. So it can be expensive if your horizon is long, if your forward model is complicated. Um, and so that's when you need uh, a forward model, the, the, sorry, a, a policy network. So the policy network basically compiles this whole process into a neural net that directly produces the best action from the state, okay? Which may or may not be possible, but uh, it, it gives you a good guess. Now, to give you a concrete example, uh, there's an interesting series of books by a, a Nobel Prize winning economist uh, that lives in New York called uh, Danny Kahneman. And he talks about two systems in the uh, human uh, mind called uh, system one and system two. So system one is the process by which you take an action without thinking, okay? Um, you're a very experienced driver and you can drive your car without even paying attention by you know, talking to someone next to you. you. You don't actually need to think about it, okay? System two is more sort of deliberate planning. So system two is when you use your internal model of the world to kind of predict in advance what's gonna happen ahead, sort of foresee what's gonna happen, and then take a deliberate uh, uh, action that you think is, is gonna be the right one according to your model. So it's more like reasoning, okay? And you can think of this you know, uh, optimization with respect to actions to minimize an objective as a form of reasoning. And we talked about this before. So uh, basically model predictive control is when you don't have a policy, you haven't learned the skill, you know what your cost function is, you have a pretty good model of the world, but you don't know how to react, okay? So a beginner chess player would be like that. Um, you, you look at the, the chess game and you have to think about all possibilities before you play because you, know, you don't know where to play. So you have to kind of imagine all the possibilities. If you are an expert player, and you play against a, a, a beginner, uh, you know immediately what to play. You don't have to think about it. I don't know if you've played uh, simultaneous games against uh, a master or grandmaster at chess. Uh, a grandmaster can play against 50 people and beat them in a few minutes um, because the player can go from a chess, you know, one opponent to another and just immediately play. Just, it's completely reactive. Um, he or she doesn't need to, to think because, you know, they've, they've kind of compiled that if you, if you want in their, in their knowledge of, of chess that they don't need to think when they see this kind of type of easy situation. So that's going from system two to system one. And uh, when you learn a skill, at first you're hesitant and you have to think about it. You know, you're hesitant when you drive, you drive slowly and you look at everything and you pay attention. And then when you're, uh, uh, experimented, you, you can just react really quickly. Basically, you've gone from model predictive control to basically training your own policy network, if you will, okay? And in the process of doing this, your, uh, your skill has gone from a sort of deliberate, planned, conscious uh, decision mechanism to a sort of subconscious, automatic uh, decision mechanism. That's what sort of acquiring expertise does. And that's, that's how you go from this diagram to that diagram where you have a policy that directly predicts the action without having to plan. Okay, got it, thanks.